consequence of not doing it, then you've got the deferred maintenance issue to deal with. And, you know, if you do the preventive maintenance, if the, the, the life cycle of a roof is 15, 20 years, then if you properly maintain that, you're not going to get to an end point that predates that 10 or 15 or 20 year life cycle. And so you're in that quandary. Do we do preventive maintenance to ensure the lifespan of a, of a facility, or do we put that off and then you run into a crisis because you, know, you can't, you have to replace it at that cost, perhaps in half the lifespan of otherwise if you had properly maintained it. A absolutely. Yeah. We released the major report back in October talking about the dilemma that we found ourselves in by failing to do preventive maintenance and now we've got this huge crisis coming down the road and that's on the uh, deferred maintenance. Yeah, it's also a good way, uh, I think, of keeping the public informed uh, about where you are in the life cycle of, uh, of various facilities. So as uh, you think about uh, future requests of the public, uh, you can inform them better uh, by letting them know where you are in your roofing program, where you are with your uh, uh, other HVAC, cap yeah, HVAC other um, uh, capital projects. Mr. Snell. Thank you, Mr. Snell. Just, I, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Dr. Carlson and uh, Dr. Casserly said. Having that kind of external expert advice in developing that plan I think is essential. And we can no longer continue to say we can't develop a plan because we don't have the money to do the work anyway. The development of the plan helps to communicate to our tax payers what the needs are and then we have to see what we get to support that. But unless you do that in-depth and broad plan of a capital, on capital facilities um, in a truly professional manner, you're never going to do anything except what uh, Dr. Carlson mentioned, and that is just trying to play catch up with uh, maintenance. Yeah. And it also puts the public in a position where they're surprised uh, when you come back with a uh, with a request. Mr. Snell. Well, before Mr. Evans spoke, he kind of stole my thunder. Um, obviously, we don't have the capacity right now in our district. Um, is it common to see districts struggle with this, trying to do everything internally? Um, yes, uh, it is. And frankly, a number of the other uh, areas that we pointed out uh, where we've made recommendations. These are, are not um, uh, observations that we made that were unusual in other big city school districts uh, either. Typically when we are uh, asked to re review the facilities uh, operations of other big city school districts, we find very dysfunctional operations. All of the uh, of the things that we saw were well within uh, the range of, of, of very high functioning uh, organizations. So what, uh, what you're seeing here is really not uh, unusual in other big city school districts across the country. Thank you. And, and my follow-up question to that is, if, if the, I don't, I'm sure the board hasn't had a discussion on it, but if we did decide to seek a, a third party, an outside group to come in to come up with the system, how's that process? Are you familiar with things like that? Could you explain that to us a little bit, Mr. Evans? We would work with staff to put that RFP together. We'd look at other RFPs used by other districts, and then we'd do an RFP process and bring a recommendation back to the school board uh, after putting the RFP together. Do you have a timeline? Sorry. I'm just making that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I figured at the end of the day, Ms. Ms. Godding said that we're going to have to, if, if we really want to do this well, we're going to put up a bond, go for a bond in 2017. I figure that if, if this is something we really mean uh, and want it to be well, we have to have this first so the taxpayers know that we're going to use their tax dollars wisely. So what was that saying you said before? Which one? The one you said about the boiler. Pay me now, pay me later. There we That's go. That's an old Fram oil, com or oil change commercial. <laughs> pay me now, pay me later. Right. 
So that's be more than happy to uh, work with you on that too. Yeah. And you. we can help get uh, uh, sample RFPs from other districts. Um, Mr. Snow, also in response to your question about timeline, we would want to really move forward with that quickly and certainly access the expertise of the Council of Great City Schools. And the an RFP like that needs to be on the street long enough for competent responders to put together good responses for us. Mr. Wayne. I feel like it's a kumbaya moment. Um, there's a couple of us on the board that have been talking about this for a while. Um, and so I, I appreciate all the hard work. Uh, I just want to make sure we don't when we do an RFQ, qualifications or a quote, I don't think we should do an RFP um, or RFB. Um, but, but I would like to encompass the entire facilities management, uh, buildings and grounds, the entire, not just the capital plan. <clears throat> for example, uh, one of the things you uh, was mentioned in the report, and I guess this is more for the board, not, not Mr. Casserly, um, talked about tagging and inventory. Uh, the going rate is usually about eight cents to 12 cents per square foot to tag and uh, log inventory. That could be an expensive endeavor. But there are companies out there, professional organizations, I know Chicago was one who had a two-year contract that guaranteed them that they would pay the two, whatever their cost of their contract um, back in savings within a certain amount of time. So I think we need to look broad at the entire facilities management, not just the capital plan, because we may be able to do some creative things to allow a professional organization to come in. Um, and that doesn't mean getting rid of staff or nothing like It's about accessing tools that they have. Um, everybody typically stays employed. Um, but it just look at the entire thing. I think we owe it to the taxpayers. We owe it to the community to have that conversation. I don't think we've ever had that conversation. Even when I was a student through, I remember I talked to Dr. Barty about it years ago, and we never had that conversation about a facility management just looking at it because even the quality measurements and the software, I mean, that's millions of dollars if we were to try to purchase that ourselves, which we can, again, use a professional organization who I think can provide us with a roadmap on how to get there um, and give us tools. And, and again, I think all we're, all we're asking, or at least all I'm asking for at this point is to just look at what's out there. And it may be best to do it ourselves afterwards, but I would like to know what the market is because I know we don't have eight cents to 12 cents currently in our budget to tag everything. On top of that, buy a software system, train people. Um, so that's that's one thing I would like to make sure we have an RFQ. And I would actually like to be uh, someone involved in that process because um, I'm kind of familiar with it from my other careers. The second thing I have, and this is more of a board question to think about, we have inclusion on here later on tonight that's asking us to hire an internal person. This report says that our basic requirements are kind of understaffed already. They asked us to hire a new director from cap for a capital program division and then also create a program management office. So those are two new positions. Um, If, we're, if we have a $421 million bond and now we're on notice because of this report that we might not have the capacity to do it, which was part of the reason reporting structure was a concern for many of us at the beginning of the bond, passage of the bond, mm -hmm. is it wise right now to hire somebody internally when we got two other positions that seem to be critical that we probably need to fill first? unless we just have enough money to fill all of all three of them. But if we're understaffed, then I'm pretty sure the inclusion person, we could find a job for them to do it for understaffed with our current largest bond in the in the history of the state of Nebraska, $460 million. So it's just something we need to think about that now we have a report in front of us saying that there's some critical positions we need to hire. We need to think about that as a board. Mr. Snow. I was just looking over here. It says uh, B and G division lacks independent hiring and termination authority, uh, which prevents managers from moving quickly on personnel issues that burdens burdens them. Could you explain that? 
to the entire <coughs> board? Because we I think, as I remember, uh, Mr. Snow it comes up through the Human Resources Department. Uh, so everything from, I believe, from job uh, posting to uh, the hiring process sits over in HR, which is not unusual. Uh, but we also notice in some districts that the operational side of the house is beginning to pull that back uh, be, uh, because they, they need uh, a quicker action uh, uh, and they're not finding it through the HR department, which largely is sort of focused on the certificated teaching side of the house and less on the, on the non-instructional side of the house. So it is an issue. So we just recommending that some consideration be given to the fact that the operations folk ought to have some authority over the posting, the interviewing, the hiring, and perhaps the termination of people, whatever the law and the statute requires or allows them to do. Okay. Um, thank you. That helps my, my question on that. Mr. Wayne. Question for Mr. Evans. Are, in light of this, are we changing how the bond is reported up to you? In what regard? Um, well, there was mention about a higher level and the uh, B and D director span is too broad and they oversee the day-to-day -day activities plus the 421. So I, I guess is that going to change how it reports to Dr. Turnquist? Is it still going to go through that director even though there's these concerns? Well, definitely. We're not making changes right now. We've just got a recommendation from an audit. We don't we don't sit at the table right then and make make recommendations to change something on the fly. Uh, so what I think we do with the information is work with Council of Great City Schools to help us prepare those next steps. For example, we talked about an RFP, RFQ, whatever we want to re refer it. We want to use your expertise to help us in that regard. Uh, we know we're short staffed. That's pretty much what we hear from this report when you look at the the broad overlay of it. Uh, I think that's the environment we're working in right now. It's going to take us a while to create the supports around that to help it be successful. And that's that's how that's how I interpret your report, kind of at the macro level. Uh, so I would not no, I wouldn't recommend that we change suddenly a reporting mechanism. In fact, I, I would say this: I, I'm really part of what's happened that I think is really creating uh, a better reporting mechanism. And you you gentlemen referred to it as well. Our CBOC group create some accountability and create some reporting that we're going to see at the board table in the not too distant future with citizens actually reporting to this board and to our community with levels of detail that are, are much finer than what we're usually usually accustomed to and I think it's much different than what this dis district's ever had before I don't believe we had that in the 1999 bond issue Dr. Turnquist would that be accurate so so no I don't see any immediately immediate changes other than we're going to work with Council of Great City Schools, use their expertise, move forward with a proposal that's going to come back to the Board of Education based on some of their, their thoughts on the RFP, RFQ, whichever it might be. And I understand there's multiple ways to, to skin that cat. And we'll, we'll ask your expertise and take advantage of that as we move forward on that. But we do have work to do, I guess. So the, the longer answer is we definitely have work to do. Will it change some reporting mechanisms? Maybe there's some shifting over time. But, but right now, I think my first my first concern is the fact is I don't have a document that I can look at right day and say, right now and say here's priority one for next year as far as maintenance is concerned and B and G ought to be looking at this for priority one and to be quite honest that's that's really something we need to have we need to have that information then we need to build on that information with some of the exact things that Mr. Wayne mentioned too I, I totally agree with that and have worked in systems where we've done that uh, as well we're, we're just playing kind of catch up and I've mentioned this before we're building the plane while we're flying it and trying to figure out how we can spin all these plates and not drop one of them, I think, is one of the critical pieces, too. So I, I think that's how I see it, is you've given us some broad range recommendations and some that probably need to be acted on sooner rather than later. And uh, we're going to use your expertise to help us on that, too, and come back to the school board. Yeah, I think there's probably any number of ways in which you could address reporting uh, issues. And we, we made a recommendation for one way to do it, and we really based it on the fact that you had such strong staff. Um, and if that were not the case, uh, we might have suggested a completely different uh, reporting structure. But you've got options um, here in terms of um, uh, where it is you place this. Uh, the issue uh, for our team was 
they're concerned that uh, it was too low in the reporting structure. Dr. Turnquist. Um, to address one other concern is we are about to fill a position for right. um, schoolhouse planning. And so that will certainly help us there. That'll, and that'll um, I have long appreciated Mr. Wayne's urging that we have a facilities capital plan. I think that should be our first priority in getting this RFQ, RFP out there to get assistance in that. Um, and the other concern about cost of software, we own software, but we need to expand into every module of that software that we own in order to do some of the very things that you mentioned. And we're planning to do that. Mr. Wayne. Um, the last thing I'll just say is uh, I know we have a policy committee. And, and again, um, I sent an email to the entire board of Millard's policy um, and Lincoln's policy. But I think it's critical um, before we go out for the RFQ or simultaneously, before we send it out, we have policy around this saying what 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 we're, what we're authorizing staff to do as far as build a capital plan and so we can stay at the high level and not get down into the weeds. I just think it's critical we have a policy around this. Okay. Um, the one that I would just like to say thank you very much. Um, I'm an auditor from my background and so reading this was very interesting and, and I'm also very appreciative of the fact that we know we have strong staff, like Mrs. Underwood said, and this was a confirmation of that, so I appreciate that. Also just appreciate some of the, maybe not um, some of the great big things, but some of the other items related to internal control and some of those things that I think could probably be addressed more quickly and more easily. And so what I would appreciate is if, um, while working with you all to, um, figure out what we're doing as far as RFQ, RFP, and, um, and looking at policy or plan. Um, also, just being able to come back to the board and saying, Here's, here were some of the recommendations that were really easy to knock off, and here's what we're doing to accomplish those, or here's a timeline for when we would accomplish some of these items so that we can kind of have a, a sense of the time frame that it will take to get this done and, and recognize that um, there are some that will take longer and some that will be easier to implement. I think I also very much, I very much appreciated the, I'm not sure if it was an appendix or the item, yes, way down at the bottom of your report, which really showed the history of your strategic support teams and some of the items, some of the areas that you can audit and, and do audit and so I appreciated having that just for reference for the future for us as well so thank you so much for being here thank and you. Oh, Mrs. Fay thank you for being here I really appreciate yeah, thank it thank you so uh, something that I, I just heard Mr. Wayne and Mrs. Scotting say that triggered something in my mind and that is that um, it is often or has been often the practice of not just this district but any organization to to pick that low-hanging fruit those easier things and mrs scotting just identified you know there are some things that we can get done in here more quickly than others but mr wayne brought us back around to policy and um i don't want to fall into the trap of accomplishing some of the easier things at the expense of really where the board needs to sit and trying to create a structure and framework to handle the bigger issues because I think sometimes well I think all the time if we if we can as a board prioritize some of um, the larger pieces of this that we can put into policy and then direct staff to implement that those smaller um, easier things to manage in a shorter time frame will naturally happen as a result of setting up that framework, developing that policy, and, and putting that structure in place. So, uh, you know, while I, I, I'm glad that Dr. Turnquist brought up that we do own software and we're going to expand into modules that we don't haven't before and we're going to say you know that to me is well is that really I mean 
I don't have any idea what you're talking about, first of all. I mean, it may or may not be the good thing to do, but the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, wait a minute, do we want to spend money on modules? Because maybe we really need to back up and focus on putting in place these big pieces so that we know that that's where we want to go or no, what we have is fine. We're going to put that out to a third party and let their expertise handle that part. We don't need to spend any more district money on modules. I'm just picking, don't, don't, you don't need to go into modules because I was using that as an example, but I, I, uh, because you mentioned it. But it's, so I, I just don't want to fall as a district into the trap of saying, well, we addressed, you know, 7, 5, and 12, um, but, uh, you know, two years down the road, we never put the framework in place to really hit those big points. So that would be my caution based on experience. I guess I have a, a question for you on that. With districts that you've worked in in the past, and maybe you would be able to provide to us some um, examples, is policy typically very general and broad, and then do most districts have a plan, which is essentially a policy that maybe spans for five or ten years? Or how do you typically see that? I, I'm curious to know um, what you typically see in large school districts. Um, usually at the policy level is the approval of the overall plan um, and, uh, and its components. Um, uh, having the board get into whether or not you're going to expand into one module or, uh, or another in your software systems, um, I would classify as well beyond policy and now into operations and not really in the purview of the board. Um, uh, but um, uh, usually the board's place uh, is in broad um, priority settings, uh, the plan, uh, the sequence uh, of events, uh, and the like, uh, but, uh, but not uh, the particulars. Thank you. Dr. Turnquist. Um, I would go back to, I don't want to frighten you with models. You know, we have a software system that we have not fully accessed all the functionalities that we already own. And that's going to be our first area of emphasis, along with the creation of a facility capital plan, which is why we need the help through this RFP, RFQ, uh, to get some expertise and some examples in that area. And I think uh, Mr. Wayne said it correctly a few moments ago. The policy should not get into the weeds. Policy needs to be something that is arching, that we can develop plans that allow us to shift gears and change direction as needed going forward. So that plan <coughs> needs to be in-depth and detailed. The policy needs to direct us to do a plan. That very good. All right. Thank you so much for being here and for um, just staying, I guess, extra time with your flight. So our, I appreciate it and, and very much appreciate your expertise and what you've brought to us and what you've also shown that you can provide to us in addition. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Okay. With that, All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move to J1C code of conduct, and that will mean okay, we've been about three and a half hours. So we're gonna need, I think, to see about maybe a uh, motion for a short recess when we get done with code of conduct. So we'll we'll go to code of conduct first, and I'm not sure. Okay, Mr. Corner. Yes. Hello. Hello, President Gotti. Members of the board, my name is Jerry Corner. I'm coordinator of community school and family engagement for the district. And on behalf of the Student Code of Conduct Revision Committee, good evening. So during the fall of 2014, um, at the direction of this board, we convened a committee to revise the Student Code of Conduct in preparation for the 2015-16 school year. Simultaneously, also during the fall of 2014, strategy 1.2.3 of our strategic plan was prioritized. 
And I'll give you just a moment to read the contents of that strategy. Several of the goals that we were tasked to achieve as a committee included gathering feedback from stakeholders, reviewing other districts' codes and model codes, as well as the review of our own OPS, Student Code of Conduct. Additionally, we reviewed best practices related to discipline across districts and took a look at various other topics in line with our goal of revising the Student Code of Conduct. Since convening, this committee has had the opportunity to engage approximately 500 stakeholders at 12 input sessions that happened throughout the duration of the year. We were able to engage student groups like the Thrive Student Group. We were able to engage unique parent groups like our Yates parents. We were able to get input from school administrators on multiple occasions to include our secondary instructional leadership network. We were able to include many of our direct service providers from around the metro which we invited in to hold this discussion on this topic. And we were able to engage um, our district citizens advisory council which are PTO PTA presidents from across the district that come together uh, to participate in those DCAC meetings. Additionally, on April 30th, these stakeholders and others were invited back to review a draft of the code and to provide further input as we discussed outcomes of the information we gathered across those 12 meetings. With that said, I'm going to pass things over to Mr. Tim Hamilton. As Mr. Corner stated, we looked at three main areas as the committee. We looked first at the input we received from the 500 individuals, 500 plus individuals. We looked at our code compared to other codes and looked at model codes from, from around the country. And we looked at uh, discipline best practices. So when looking at the um, input from the stakeholders, there were three, three things that were pretty evident. One, most people thought that our code was, was too long, had a lot of legal jargon, uh, and it was punitive in nature. That being said, if our code very much states that if this happens, then this will happen, and generally it was exclusionary. Uh, people stated that they did not believe that suspension was uh, an effective way to change behavior. and. All of the stakeholders we met with still think, still believe, like we all do, that uh, we should have a safe environment for kids. When we reviewed our code and other districts' code, most other districts that we looked at in the model districts had a tiered or leveled responses to misbehavior. They were corrective uh, uh, and had interventions rather than exclusionary. And the big thing that we have currently is we have a uh, K-6 code and a secondary code. All of the districts we looked at, all of the model districts had a single code for all students. Uh, again, looking at ours, most of our, our responses were exclusionary. And we, our code is full of a lot of information that isn't necessarily the code of conduct. When you look through our current code, it has a lot of things related to curriculum, uh, related to graduation, things that aren't necessarily part of the code that are more part of a, a district handbook. Um, so when we look at best practices, uh, uh, the best practice would say that discipline emphasizes prevention and intervention. And exclusionary tactics uh, don't change behavior, uh, and nor does it result in a safer school. I'll now call up Dr. Amy Williams. Thanks, sir. So to summarize, we ended up with three big changes to the, the revised code of conduct. First of all, our this proposed code does apply to all OPS students. 
Um, we've sorted the behavior violations into charts with corresponding tables of uh, potential responses for administrators, and that's really the change there is in response of our, our old code was very much if this happens on the first offense you'll do this, on the second offense you'll do this, and it really doesn't provide very much leeway in terms of what we are recommending to administrators. Um, finally, we did take that information that's in the current code, but, but really doesn't have anything to do with the code of conduct, um, and really we felt contributed to the cumbersome nature of the current code that was a big piece of feedback from our stakeholders, and we put that information into a separated district handbook. That district handbook will still appear in all school handbooks, but it won't be part of the clearly separate buff-colored code of conduct. And finally, we wanted to talk a little bit about next steps. Really, our next steps are really about building capacity. No code of conduct is really going to impact student behavior, nor will it impact school climate. Those things are impacted by be staff behavior, school policies. Um, but what we can do is we can increase staff familiarity with the code. Administrators are going to uh, need some time to process the new code and talk about how this new code will be applied. Um, we also want to make sure that teachers and other staff and parents are very are familiar with the new code just because it looks a little bit different in some sections. Um, and finally, we know moving forward with this code that, that in the past our district has not done a good job in building capacity with school-wide behavior support. Um, nor with uh, really working with administrators on alternatives to suspension. So we know those capacity pieces are needed. Um, lucky for us, those are uh, some of the priority stra prioritized strategies in our strategic plan. So that we plan to work collaboratively with, with those groups of people in moving forward with this revised code if it is approved. And that completes our presentation. Are there questions? Okay. Are there questions? Mrs. Fay. So I sent out some questions uh, one time that to, and Mr. Ray answered, and so I feel good about that. But I had, there was one question I asked, um, and I want to go back to it, that was what the oversight process will be. And um, I, I'm not, I, I guess I'd like a little bit further explanation on oversight for the, the new code because it was the data collected by the Department of Education that caused some of the um, uh, penalties that we're currently facing right now. And I want to make sure that we're capturing that data and monitoring it on, in an ongoing, on an ongoing basis and you know, reviewing it on a regular timetable and so that we know where where we are, who's being disciplined, um, how often, w at what level, you know, so that we're looking at student demographics um, and the different schools and that there's some um, trigger or tipping point where we know we've crossed a threshold at this school or with this particular demographic or whatever it is that we need to maybe look and adjust. And is it just an issue at this school? Is it a district-wide issue? I just want to make sure that we don't have this implemented if this were to pass for a whole year or for 18 months and then just be right back where we were, where we have some of the same issues that we have now. I think we need to always be um, attaching data to these things and monitoring it regularly <coughs> and providing some sort of um, trigger mechanism that allows for us to change course if we need to. Okay, thank you. Mr. Snow. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I sit on the Student Code of Conduct Committee, uh, and to answer your question, Ms. Faye, there, this is a tool. So this is the same guideline that is for the elementary school, so it's a tool. And one of the things that we actually 
all agreed on is at the end of the day the implementation of this tool um, and mr. Ray's laughing but we all sat in a room and at first I wasn't completely okay with it um, but talking over with the entire committee I understood their philosophy that if we approve the tool then we can create uh, implementation of it a culture and that's that big piece that culture change and we kind of ended up on whose overall responsibility that was and I think Sharif was not in his head that he wanted that responsibility um, but if that's something that this committee can do and come back and we actually do research and actually do work with the research department and do inventory to figure out um, what actual interventions are being used in schools and the definition of them and how they break out. So if one school's using this, one school's using that, and how do we share that amongst our principals and the executive directors? Uh, I think that's something we need. Um, and I think overall, long term, looking at what other school districts are doing and taking this tool and taking it to other experts outside of Omaha and figuring out, hey, is this, is this a pretty good tool and what do you think we need to build that capacity? Because right now, in my opinion, these four don't have the capacity to do it themselves. So how do we build that framework within OPS to the point that we don't end up with something that comes down the line and we get sanctioned by the federal government of the state of Nebraska? That's something that we can see coming all along the line and we can change those uh, as they come. Um, but one of the things I, 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 I want the community know as well as the board members is this will not and I say it again this will not lower suspension rates disciplinary rates it just gives different alternatives and I think that is the next step for the committee um, and I want people to know that so in a year from now or halfway through the school year people aren't saying you approve the code and still my child is being suspended X Y and Z uh, I think that's next phase and how do we really expand this into the schools and actually have more time with training principals as well as teachers on curriculum day about the code so when they go in the classroom they're not spending 10 minutes but they really understand what the code means and they're really explaining it on a student level as well as when they have those parent meetings and really explain it on a parent level because I think so we get so caught up into our our job that my job is to teach but explaining this we can train the teachers well as well as the principals and understand the new code I think we're off to a good start. I, I would just kind of like to piggyback off of what Mr. Snow just said. First of all, I do appreciate the, um, I don't know, if ease of readability. From a parent standpoint, and I'm sure from a student standpoint, it seems much easier to look and say, okay, there's not so many words on the page. Here's the things that are at these levels. So I liked the chart approach to it. I agree with Mr. Snow on the fact that it is a tool and one of the things and I don't know um, if Mr. Scanlon noticed the same thing I did but we interviewed four candidates outside of the district for um, high school principal positions by a position um, earlier last week and one of the things that I thought was interesting that they all said was the code of conduct is something the Board of Education passes and then we figure out how to get that implemented in our buildings so that it's effective as far as a discipline tool. And I know that the individual who was on the agenda tonight and approved as the Burke High School principal had lowered his suspensions from 3,000 to 1,500 in the course of two years. And it wasn't because he wasn't disciplining, it was it was just more effective ways of doing that and and I think in sitting through those interviews I was really impressed with some of the um, methodologies that they used which incented kids from a positive behavior standpoint to change their behavior or made them realize oh I'm not going to necessarily have a suspension I'm going to do community service on Saturday and I'll have to turn that back into the school in order to complete my um, discipline action so there were just a lot of really creative methods used with this as the main tool and I appreciated all of them speaking to that topic when they spoke in the public interviews and and really speaking to some of the creative ideas that are out there so it was very um, enlightening and I appreciated that so I just wanted to share that aspect Mr. Vargas, did you have your hand up? Okay, Mr. Vargas. Thank you very much. 
Uh, this thing's on the similar vein as um, what Ms. Fay mentioned. <clears throat> uh, it's great to see this as a tool. Uh, it's great to see that this is, um, you know, we're taking steps in the right direction. We're thinking about building capacity. We're thinking about um, uh, making clear what our definitions are, uh, expanding upon what we're trying to do and create pathways for what, you know, what we mean when we're doing a code of conduct. But I, I am still, I do want to make sure this gets back to not being, I just think back to my time in the classroom, uh, you know, being activity driven versus being outcome driven. Um, we could be very activity driven, which obviously we have a lot of things that we're doing. We created this. We have these next steps for how to build capacity. But it still gets me back to what Ms. Faye was thinking, was saying, mm -hmm. how are we as a district um, within each program making sure we're collecting the right data points intermittently between each quarter, not just at the end of the year, mm -hmm. to guide whether or not each of these individual things are working? Because if not, then we're going to have to wait till the end of the year and just look for the big school report card on whether or not we're seeing decreases in suspension or decreases in any other metrics that we're using. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be enough to guide our work. Um, and if we don't have it, I think it's easy for us to get into this place where we keep doing things that are good, but we can't evaluate to the extent they're good in a, in a data-driven way. Mm -hmm. And then the board isn't informed enough um, to make decisions on, on on whether or not we should keep keep it, and you know, uh, or whether or not we should make changes, and I think you guys are probably in that same in that same scenario. Mm -hmm. so I just want to make you know, I want to think about training for administrators uh, or ongoing training monthly. Like, how are we evaluating those training? What's the standard we're doing across them? How are we housing that data? How is that data meaningfully you know coming up to Superintendent Evans and then being reported back to us? This way, we're actually fully informed and are being data driven. I don't think that's the, when I, even though I was looking at the report for the Council of Great City Schools, that even said our data, you know, data are the way that we're data driven in the district, it, that's an area of growth. We're, we're not using the data to inform our ongoing mm -hmm. uh, building of capacity and to tell us what we should do differently, like day to day. And that's something we need to work on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we agree. And, I, and to be honest, we had a pretty extensive conversation about data today. Uh, and I'm, I'm very hopeful and excited about some things that are being prioritized uh, going forward. Mr. Evans. Uh, thanks, Madam President. Uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Williams. That's exactly what we want to do. Uh, part of this is in the stat session when we've had the stat reports as we look at the strategic plan. That's part of what happens when the schools meet with the stat teams. And uh, Mr. Luaru, we've been talking about that for next year now. We did, uh, with the volunteer schools this year, we were doing almost a monthly stat session, which was probably too heavy on the data analysis, because that, that was all data analysis. But I think we're going to be recommending to pull that back some. Uh, Dr. Garnett, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But this would clearly be one of those items that would be part of that stat process, because you're looking at all the data that's collected in, in, in those meetings uh, that you've had. I know we've had lots of board reports from Rohini and the UB, UPD staff on that. Uh, this is this is exactly what we would want in that, but I'm not sure about monthly. That's what we did this year for the volunteer, and I, I think that was a little overwhelming for everybody, and the recommendation from the body was to, as we move to all the schools, is to, to scale that back. Did we say every other month or once a quarter? Once a quarter? So that's what we're looking at is a once a quarter thorough analysis of all the data, not just this piece of data, but all the data uh, with, with that stat process that we talked about here at the board table. Mr. Wayne. Uh, Mr. Ray, just a qu question real quick. Now, this current one is based off of the, what's currently going on K through 6th grade, well, at our elementary schools. This revised code is based off of what was used there. The formatting is similar to the K-6 book okay. uh, when you look at interventions by level. The, and the wording and all the back um, chunky legal wording uh, is a carryover from the um, the secondary code, so the, the wording is very similar in the secondary code. And that's just as, as a note, chunky, was it clunky? I think or it's chunky? clunky. Was it clunky, clunky. or chunky? Um, they, um, and just as a reminder, this is a draft, right. so um, there, there, there will probably be some changes and updates when this comes to action, but we'll point that out to you uh, when it's presented of any changes um, to that book. It is a draft, it should have been watermarked with a draft, but. And the reason I say that because I, I just want to make sure the public's clear, like Mr. Uh, Snow said, that uh, this is somewhat currently being used in our 
elementary schools and suspension rates were still high, um, according to whatever data that's been out there. So with that being said, we have to just make sure it's a tool um, and people understand that it is a tool. But I do want to point out, I think, a leap in the right direction um, on page 23 deals with SROs and it limits, well, it's a guideline and, and again, officers are still officers. so this guideline doesn't necessarily pertain to them, but it's a starting point for our school administrators, uh, school administrators to work with our SROs to understand kind of their roles. And I wanted to point that out. I think that's a, a great step. I think the next step is for this committee to work with, uh, and I am on this committee to work with the county attorney, um, OPS, and the, and the law enforcement agencies to develop a contract, which is a standard based practice of what is actual um, ticketable offenses and police reports uh, and work through that so there's a, a binding contract on the SROs as well but I just want to I want to publicly thank the committee um, as Mr. Snow said he came in um, wanting to, to, to stall it or not stall it kill it maybe is a better word and just wait till next year and and Matt was on the total, Mr. Scanlon was on the total opposite side. And so um, after a movie scene like Over the Top, uh, Mr. Ray was, was the official. We had a big arm wrestling match. And it ended in a tie. And that's how we all came to consensus. We all just said, let's move forward. I'm, I'm kind of joking about that. But there was a lot of fruitful dialogue. And I do want to uh, acknowledge that when we have conversations and we, and we talk about high level things, you can actually build consensus and this is um, a very emotional and big issue for certain parts of the community and um, everybody who represents different sides sat in the room had a, had a frank conversation and came together so I want to thank the committee for for having that conversation and having it uh, respectfully and um, even though it resulted in a tie, we're going to switch and go left hands next time and see who can win the, the wrestling match. I mean, the arm wrestling match. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. It has been good to have this process take place in committee, and so I'm I'm also very grateful for the committee members for working through this. What I would ask is that if anyone has any comments as they read through this before we get to the next board meeting, if you would please direct those to Mr. Ray in the next week or so. So in the next week, if you could get your comments to him, this will be back on our June 1st agenda as an action item. And um, we need to have it, I think, at that time so that there's time for printing and publication to each of the schools and, and the training that's necessary as staff ramps up for the 15-16 year. So if everybody could do that, I would appreciate it very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for presenting to us. And thank you for all the hard work that you've put in. Thank you. OK, with that, we will move um, to committees of the board update. And we'll start with the accountability committee. And the report there is that we had the item for superintendent's evaluation on the consent agenda to this evening. I want to thank Mr. Ray for uh, and research for working to get the um, data piece for the last two school years available to us and also to tell us when the data will next be available for this school year. So I, I thank them for that. Um, and at this time, what I would like to ask from board members is to go ahead and complete the superintendent's evaluation. And if you could get that to us, I think we said, when did we say, Mr. Ray? I had that written down by June. I think by maybe June 5th, so that Ms. Williams and I can get the um, items typed up and ready to go for the June, the that second meeting in June. Is that correct? That will work. Yes, that would be perfect. Okay. 
Right. So if you can, so if board members could get the tool back to us um, by June 5th, it'd probably be easy if you gave it to us at the easiest if you gave it to us at the next board meeting. We would appreciate that. Mr. President Gunn? Yes. Is there a way that we can make that uh, PDF um, markable? We, we talked about that, Mr. Ray. If it's no, then it's fine. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> it's no, so, it's no. Mr. Uh, Wayne, you said something nice about the code of conduct, which is the first time in four years, so I will do whatever I can. I'll fill it out for you. Yes, I did vote no four years in a row, so. Yes. We'll try. We did talk about that, and it was, uh, at this time, we had a challenge timing wise to get that done as a PDF and and we recognize that going forward that's the way we'd like it to be with that I'm going to move on to budget and audit mrs. Faye and I met with mrs. Kenoki and um, a couple of staff she is currently and, and this is the exciting part of the priority based budgeting piece has met with staff from all the schools in the district and gone over the staffing needs for next year and pretty much we will stay with very similar staffing but as buildings have adjustments they'll come back to uh, finance and probably HR and everybody else CIA to to make suggestions just from a high-level standpoint um, Property tax valuation for Omaha Public Schools is projected to grow at 2.9%, and the learning community is projected to grow by 4.97%, so almost a 5% growth in valuation that will benefit Omaha Public Schools because we're part of the learning community. So that's a very significant item. Preliminary budget development has already started, and there's conversations specific to two areas um, and those two areas are textbook adoption and technology and they are continuing to work through some very specifics on how to get everything done within the amount of money that we have to spend right now we're looking at potentially about nine million dollars in uh, textbook adoption the great part is Mrs. Kenoki is also looking at the various fund balances and working through where those balances are at, what seems reasonable and what would be appropriate. What we're planning on doing is the first board meeting in July is having the opportunity for her to walk us through in detail how the budget works, the various fund balances, what her projections are that she'll be bringing back to us in September and give us the opportunity to ask questions about specifics and to see what uh, what overages we might have and, and also to be able to understand what available funds are there after we get some more finalized numbers in, specifically thinking about the new teacher contract and also the other contracts that are going on. So that's the plan for the, the meeting in July. It gives her the opportunity to um, develop that a little bit more, have some more concrete ideas for where we'll be, and, um, and then for us to be able to understand how that all flows into the big picture. I think we really haven't taken the time to look at all the different fund balances and to see how the spending in each one occurs. So she will be spending a significant amount of time with us at that first meeting in July, but I think that will be helpful for all of us and give us the opportunity to ask specific questions. So as you think of questions that you might have coming up before July about funding or budget items, would you please forward those to her so that she can have that conversation with staff and folks within her department and then Mrs. Fay and I um, are scheduled to meet again as the budget committee on June 15th. I would just ask that if you can get those items to her by June 15th, that would be great. Are there any questions on budget and audit? All right. Communications has not met. Policy, we are still working through all the 
big policy items and, and I believe you have the 2000s, Mr. Ray. He's got them right there in his hand. The policy 2000s to pass out to all of us. And, and hopefully we will be through most of these policies and then the policy committee can start to meet and move forward. Americanism committee, did they meet? They have not met since we had our last meeting. Student assignment plan. Um, no updates since the workshop that we had besides um, you probably noticed that the student assignment plan did not make it on the agenda for tonight uh, which it was originally planned to be on tonight's agenda it's been moved to June 15th um, really for no other reason other than we had a lot on the agenda tonight and we don't need to approve it um, you know there's no schedule impacts um, if we do move it to June 15th so that does give um, the board a little more time to request additional information or ask questions as necessary thank you legislative committee do you want to wait till we get to action or okay we'll move that to action construction manager at risk has there been any meetings related to that no. Nope. Specialty schools review and recommendations. We uh, do not currently have a uh, report today, but we are working um, to identify a date for us to meet in the very near future. CBOC. Uh, we're meeting this Wednesday, and I think that we'll be discussing um, the presentation by a uh, CBOC member to the uh, full board uh, at a future uh, board meeting. Thank you. Code of conduct? We just presented. And you did a fine job. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> I take full credit for that. <laughs> um, with that, I would entertain a motion to just take a short recess before we move to action items. So moved. Is there a second? Second. So motion by Ms. Williams and a second by Ms. Sunderwood to take a short recess. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Scanlon? Aye. Snow? Aye. Underwood? Vargas? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Wayne? Williams? Aye. Faye? Aye. Godding? Aye. America? Seven nine. Motion carries. We will readjourn in about five minutes.
have all the musical references and all that. That was really good. Yeah, that was very good, Willie. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, at this time, a 907 will reconvene, and we will move to item J2A, which is legislative update. I believe that Mrs. Fay is going to give us the legislative update. Mr. Lindsay is probably still in Lincoln. So Mr. Lindsay um, is still in Lincoln, I think. They were scheduled to day in session tonight until 10. Um, I do want to draw your attention to the matrix that was on the board uh, meetings and our position on which is the second item the second um, attachment there and I'm Sorry, I didn't have it open. Um, I'm looking for the attached page, the page 14. Thank you, Miss Scotting was ready. So page 15, the position that we took on um, the Osers merger. 14. Oh, there it is. So page 14, and that's LB 448. So initially, just to refresh your memories, initially we um, didn't take a position on it because of the way that it was written. And then eventually we adopted this position. Um, there's a couple of points in here. Um, the board at the end, the Board of Education fundamentally believes that it should retain the responsibility for oversight and management of the administrative functions of the retirement system. For as long as the Omaha Public Schools <clears throat> retains the liability of the system. So that was the position that we approved back in March. Since that time, um, we've worked with the trustees and the OEA and Senator Nordquist. Um, and the amendment that was debated today is um, Amendment 1524 to LB 448. And I think the other attachment is the full amendment correct so but it's a lot of pages long so I'm just going to summarize some of the main points for you and we, I apologize we don't have a summary document but you do have the full amendment and um, when I'm done um, the board may want to take this as an action item that's why it's under action so uh, point number one is that the administrator of OSERS um, will serve as an ex officio non-voting member of the Nebraska Investment Council. This person is not a designee of the Board of Education, so it just sets as a non-voting member. I think likewise, although it, I don't think it's in here, in this summary document is that the Nebraska Invest Investment Council representatives um, serves as a non-voting member on the Board of Trustees. Isn't that correct? 
well, it was in there at one time. It was in there, and I haven't gone back and read all 51 pages or whatever it is, but I think that that was in there. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these, Mrs. Scotting. So if there's something that you want to expand upon, there's a number of them. So I'm going to pick the highlights that maybe r relate to our position the most. Um, the, the authority and control of the administration of OSERS will be transferred to the, to the trustees upon the enactment of LB 448. Um, and the Board of Education retains the final approval authority before investments until January 1st. I know um, Mrs. Neela Sprash told me today that it may not have the emergency clause in passage so that some of the dates potentially might change, but this is the way the amendment's currently written. The transfer, transfer of investment control and authority, I'm going to read this directly to you, adopts the proposed revisions by OPS that modify original provisions that suggested there would be an assignment of actual investment related agreements to the state investment officer. The appointment of the administrator to OSERS, the administrator will be appointed by the Board of Trustees and approved by the Board of Education, but I want to clarify that that is one of the points that's slightly different from the position that we took back in March. The administrator will hire, dismiss, and otherwise supervise the staff of the retirement system. That's also a little bit different, I think, than our position, depending on how broadly you define the position. Um, the actuary for OSERS will be um, chosen by the trustees, not by the Board of Education. The trustees will have the authority to choose their own legal counsel. They don't have to, but they can. The straight state treasurer will act as the treasurer of the retirement system and is authorized to make payments to OPS upon request of the administrator. There's a requirement that the district will provide reasonable office and record storage space. Uh, here at the TAC building, and that all expenses for those office accommodations are, are paid for out of the retirement system, not by OPS. Um, there's a few other things that aren't in here. The, um, the employees um, of the of OSERS will be OPS employees. And um, I'm, there may be some policy level things that we have to do as far as the hiring process, the official hiring process, so that they um, have access to OPS benefits because they will be OPS employees, but they'll actually be hired and supervised by OSERS and the trustees, by the administrator who's supervised by the trustees. Go ahead, Mr. Snow, if there's points so, you want to pick out. I, so using space, I mean, so they'll be paying for office space, mm -hmm. will they be paying for meeting space as well? It says reasonable. So be I think because that's... Because we have to staff a person for their meetings, correct? So that to, should come Well, out. and that's a good question that maybe Mrs. Neela Sprash can answer. <clears throat> I don't know that their meetings will continue to be public meetings or not. I'm not clear on that. So, um, I mean, she available. She's not available. Mrs. Neela Sprash, I have a question for you. Will the will the OSERS meetings continue if the amendment passes as it is currently? Um, it passed its first round of debate today, but if the amendment passes as is, are the OSERS? trustees meetings will they continue to be public meetings that require public notice and or that's something we're unclear on isn't it I, I think it would be unclear 
Okay. Uh, the way, the current language that I've read, I don't think it clearly states that. I, I believe it would probably be considered uh, just like the Nebraska Investment uh, Council and the Nebraska Public Employees Retirement Board are considered public entities um, and have ex uh, express exemptions in the statute. I would think it would be similar to that, but I don't know if it states that specifically, so there could be some question as to whether or not it would be or would not be. So keep in mind that there the uh, responsibilities of the trustees are would be limited to managing the administration of the retirement system, and so they would not be doing the same kinds of things that the investment council is doing. So I think if they were not, that would be the argument for them not being public meetings. But that's a good point and something that'll have to be fleshed out. I'll just, just to summarize so that everybody is very clear, the investment piece will take place in Lincoln with the Nebraska Investment Council. So they will, after, assuming this passes, after January 1, they would make all the investment decisions. Those would not come back to us to approve. However, I, I do think we would want to get updates on a quarterly basis or have that as a receipt of reports so that we know and understand where our investments stand on a regular basis since it's our liability on the unfunded piece. So I would think that that would be important for us to continue to uh, monitor and keep our eye on. From an administrative standpoint, the OSER's office has never actually been the ones to cut the checks and send them to everyone. That actually takes place through um, comp and benefits. So those costs that comp and benefits incur going forward would be charged back to OSER's for the processing of payments and, and all of the work being done. So the majority of what would happen in the OSER's office, I think, would be retirement counseling and non-investment decisions, non-really payment decisions, or non-payment activity. Um, and, I, and I think what I would ask, specific to um, the employees being OSER's trustees employees, and I think there will be some work that has to be done there because they won't be on our consent agenda any longer and they won't be a part of our uh, process of approval. Without that, there will need to probably be some changes so that they can continue to receive health care benefits that they would be a part of OSERS um, as far as a retirement system. So there are some things that will technically have to change on our end once the legislation passes. And I think what I would like to ask is once it passes and once we get into January and all of that difficult work of moving the investments over is that we just um, monitor um, from Mrs. Kenoki's standpoint the cost of maintaining that office so that we have a clear understanding and so that the taxpayer has a clear understanding of what's happening now that the investment piece is not in the office. So that's one thing I would like to ask that we um, have updates on. One of the questions I have is, I thought that the legislation changed it so that the actuary was um, appointed by the OSER's trustees but approved by the Board of Education. Is that, is that, is that correct? I don't. Did you see that? Ms. Smerica. That was, I thought, a suggestion that we made that was rejected. Um, We're, is the attached amendment the most recent one? I'm not sure what happened today. Because as of this one, there is on page 20, start of page 26, top of page 27, um, it does say the selection of the actuary shall be approved by the Board of Education. Okay. Okay, well, I, I thought good. that was the case do you, at one um, point in time. Maybe before we do any further discussion, do you want a motion, Mrs. Scotting? Or do you or do you just want clarification still on what is in the I think law itself? Or I the think amendment? there's some clarification that we still need to okay. have. 
Ms. Williams. So I just want to clarify, so the Board of Education is still liable. We have no authority, but we're liable. Is that correct? Well, I think there's some disagreement about that. So I think that that's, I mean, I think, yes, we're liable for the unfunded mandate, but I don't know how liable we are for, uh, Megan will come in. Um, I think it depends on which part you're talking about and who you're talking to. As far as um, like bad investment advice, for example, that there's a question there. But it so depends on which part you're talking. The unfunded mandate, yes. Ta Omaha taxpayers are still liable. Correct. Um, a decision that comes out of the OSER's office, I think, uh, you know, we this is something we discussed a lot um, as a committee and and threw around to our advisors on the committee and I think we had, it's, un, it's unclear understanding that anybody can sue anybody at any time for anything. It's unclear how that would pan out. Okay, thank you, I just, you know. And if I might correct one clarity. thing I said earlier, I do believe now looking at the legislation that the fact that the meetings are public meetings. They are public yeah. meetings, okay. Yes. So that would be another expense that Mr. Snow brought up um, as far as recording the meetings and everything that would be charged back to Correct, and we can charge any expense back to OSERS, mm -hmm. uh, square footage, for example, of the uh, space that they utilize mm -hmm. in the building, you know, reasonable, anything that's a reasonable expense, um, you know, s s typically the things that we already do now for OSERS. That would be good to do. Ms. America. Um, I, I did really quick pull up the legislature's webpage, um, and it looks like the AM, I don't know what my computer's or laptop's doing. The amendment was advanced with no changes made to it. So what we are looking at is what was amended into the bill. So this is, I think Justin has a question. There was, a, there, there was a proposed amendment change that failed that dealt with part of Mrs. Williams, Ms. Williams' question regarding liability in the ARC, um, and that wasn't defeated. So uh, and Mr. Norquist said on the floor that if for whatever reason, um, once the investment council began making investments, then from that point forward, obviously the state would bear liability on those decisions. And if there was an arc, which is an increase, or um, the, the state has to step in to provide additional dollars to bring that up, uh, to bring OSERS up to proper funding, it would come from the state through the arc. Um, once the investment council takes over um, investments because that that was what the proposed amendment is i'm sure they'll try to bring it back again um and that might be an area that uh we have to discuss sooner or later because from what i'm hearing the not sure the governor likes the idea of the state being liable for o omaha public schools uh retirement system since we're separate. So I don't know where the votes are for a veto. Hasn't gone that far yet, but just FYI. Can I get clarification on that? You're saying that once the Nebraska Investment Council takes over, or correct, that at that point, that differential between what our unfunded liability was prior to them taking over and then going forward, if there is a necessary arc, that in the legislation today, it would require the state to fund that arc. It would match whatever the the state would do, whatever it does for the for the the state requirement. Um, but Norquist and Mello both on the mic said it doesn't make sense to have the state investment council uh, make recommendations and invest, and if they do a poor job, turn back to OPS and say you are now uh, liable for the bad investment. But our current unfunded liability is still. Omaha Public Schools. So on the day that it takes effect, whatever that amount is, um, we'll still, that'll still, OPS will still own that. Okay, is there a motion that? So for the committee, I move that uh, the board approve support of the um, amendment 1524 to LB 448. 
Is there a second to Mrs. Fay's motion? Second. So there's a motion by Mrs. Fay and a second by Mr. Snow that the uh, Board of Education, based on the committee's recommendation, approve the amendment 1555 to LB 448. Is there any discussion? I think it's a, is it, what's the amendment number? I think it's 1555. Is that correct? Or is it 1524? Which one is it? 1555 is what I have on, that's posted on the board agenda. Okay. That, that wasn't what I said, so I'm glad you, because on this one, it's 1524. Okay, so 1555. So, okay. And I, point Mr. Of, Wayne and then. Point of clarification. I mean, aren't we just approving LB 448 as it currently is today? Isn't that the, I mean, as it is today? As amended? Yeah. I mean, isn't that what we're. LB 448 is as amended. amended? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Well, right. Did you have a second? Yeah. I, I did. Mr. Snow was the second. So, so I guess I just, I wanted to clarify um, that from my perspective, the opportunity for us to work with the Nebraska Investment Council is a great opportunity to be able to use their expertise. Um, the Nebraska Investment Council officer is fairly new to the state, but has a significant amount of experience um, with, um, I think he grew a $5 million to $20 million fund over a period of time um, in another state. And I think it gives us the opportunity to work with the expertise there and also work with the Nebraska Investment Council. So I think while everything is not quite perfect with the legislation in the way that maybe we had envisioned it, it's positive that the Board of Education will still approve the actuary. I think that's an important item to note. I think it's also important to note that OPS will be reimbursed for OSER's expenses um, from the OSER's office. And I think that it's important to note um, that we can monitor what those expenses are, um, just so that the public is aware of that as well as we move forward, recognizing that we're probably going to have to make some changes related to current policy specific to this very small group of employees that we're not approving um, on our consent agenda. Mrs. Fay. Well, I'd while we're all thanking committees, I do want to thank the legislative team, the whole team. And we wrestled with this um, all legislative season and, and um, didn't always agree and didn't always agree with the trustees. Um, but I think this is a, a good example of compromise. And like Mrs. Scotting said, nobody got everything that they wanted. Um, but the trustees also unanimously not that we voted yet, but the trustees unanimously supported um, the amend amendment. And I think I feel comfortable um, sending this out from the committee because we did talk through so many of the pieces and hopefully you followed some of it you know, as we brought reports to you and Mr. Lindsay's brought them to you, but I think the most important thing to remember, aside from some of the administrative details that um, we may disagree with, uh, disagree about, I think the most important thing is that I, I really feel that it's best for our teachers and everyone who's invested in that retirement system that we've turned this over to the Nebraska Investment Council. I think that's a really big win for anybody who's a part of this system and I think that's really what we were after from the beginning and it also um, puts us more in alignment we're not completely merged with the state but it puts us almost completely in alignment with the rest of the um, teachers across the state and so I, I think that we need to really just um, celebrate the fact that we this is that's the most important part is that this is good a good solid move for anybody who's invested in this retirement system and that's that's the most important thing the administrative details are are less 
less so. Just, and, and I thank you for those comments because I would agree with you that that's, that's the most important part of this. It's for our, our employees and that's what we should be focused on. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? Hearing none, roll call please. Snow. Aye. Underwood. Aye. Vargas. Aye. Wayne. Aye. Williams. Aye. Faye. Aye. Gotting. Aye. America. Aye. Scanlon. Aye. That's an aye aye. Motion carries. So I think the only other parts of the legislative report, um, we I think we all got an email from Mr. Evans earlier, and was that just to the legislative team, or did the whole board get the email about where, just legislative team, okay. Um, so I, I believe that, um, well, we did believe, and, and maybe Megan's heard, Megan's been communicating with Mr. Lindsay through the meeting, since we cannot, so maybe she has an update, but until their debate started a couple of hours ago, we believe that the learning community was um, going to remain the same, no changes whatsoever until next year, and that it would be a part of the discussions in the interim. But then there was an update, and so I'll let Megan. So I believe tonight on the floor um, they had three amendments uh, from uh, Senator Kittner. Uh, the first amendment this is to LB 525. Yeah, 525. Um, with regard to the learning community, there were various uh, differences in, in the amendments. Uh, the first amendment, uh, I believe, failed uh, with a vote of only 13 for um, the uh, uh, amendment. And then the other two amendments were pulled by Senator Kittner uh, 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 for not for consideration. So I believe um, they advanced. Uh, 525 or uh, I, I'm not quite sure on that yet though I think they did yeah so they did advance without it. the amendments so we're Correct. back to where we were at the start of the meeting which right. there's nothing on the floor whatsoever about the learning and, community. and they did remove um, uh, the uh, legislation uh, with regard to uh, Senator Kolofsky's um, he allowed them to remove that language uh, tonight without uh, so debate. those were the additional dollars for AP and um, there was another piece, career, right, and that was I think a price tag of about two million was the dollars that were attached to it and so that was um, right outside of TOSA and that was pulled by Senator Kowalski. I think that's about it. We're just going to have to keep, th these are the last few, how many days? Less than a month. Eight days, eight days left. left. Eight session days. Okay. Right. They wrap up essentially right after we finish our next meeting. So, with that, I'm I'm going to move J two B to the end of action just because we have folks here um, for a couple of the other items. So the first item I'm going to go to is next is J two C which is grade level configuration, McMillan, Monroe, Beverage, Hale, and Morton. We have the same items that we had last time on, as far as information. I did want to um, address one point, which was uh, Mr. Wayne's question on policy. So policy 0304, item F, under duties of the superintendent of schools, says that the superintendent shall have the right to consolidate classes, assign students to buildings and classes, or transfer them from one attendance unit to another. We have had a significant amount of discussion on this particular item of grade level configuration. At this time, what I'd like to do is ask the superintendent what his recommendation would be um, from staff and from his perspective on the grade level piece, and then I think We've all had the opportunity to comment quite a bit. We'll go around the table and if everyone can give one or two brief statements on your position on this or, or, or points that you want to make sure that you have on the record, we'll do that. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Evans to give us his recommendation on grade level configuration. Thank you, Madam President. And <clears throat> with the five schools mentioned here, currently the 7-8 configuration, I'm going to con con uh, I'm going to agree with 
the uh, principals who were here tonight uh, and confirm their recommendation uh, moving to 678 configuration. Um, I, th I think they stated it best. Uh, their comments really have, is what I've seen in other settings as well. Um, I think for these five particularly, it just makes a whole lot of sense, and I think our young people will be better served uh, if we move forward to that recommendation. So I just want to concur with what we heard earlier tonight from our building level principals. Uh, I think that's the recommendation from district staff and superintendent as well. Thank you. At this time, if you'd like to make one or two just brief statements if you have any if you don't have any comments that's fine as well on this item mrs. Underwood um, I just wanted to mention I thought it was good to hear from the principals um, we I think that uh, our research department had to, done surveys of staff when we had been discussing the grade lo level configuration thing but other than that we hadn't heard directly from them on it so I thought that was um, uh, it was good to hear their perspective directly um, and then just as a reminder these schools are on the agenda in particular because of the bond program and needing to move things ahead um, as schedules go for that so because of that I will be and, and in addition to um, the support from the principals I'll be voting um, in favor of this in it, Mr. policy policy 0304 which item F duties of the superintendent of schools page one And I will just state that I'll be voting in favor of this. After looking at all the data um, on student achievement, vertical alignment in buildings, it seems pretty evident that based on what the principal said as well, that the longer a child can be in a building, the more opportunity there is for staff to work with the students. And since my child currently is in a 6-8 building, I've really seen the benefit of that alignment and those teachers in sixth grade really working with the seventh and eighth grade teachers to ensure that specifically the writing piece is addressed and then the math piece because we know that our sixth graders who are in elementary schools use one math curriculum but our students who are sixth graders in middle school use a different math curriculum so just the opportunity um, for students to have better alignment across the district which helps with mobility when we consider the significant number of students that are mobile each year in our district. Are there any other comments? Whoops, Mr. Scanlon. Um, if, if this were to pass, I guess the, the biggest thing that I would have to say is the communication plan uh, to the to the middle schools that are changing the elementary schools that are changing and the implementation plan um, you know what can sound like a good idea um, can be poorly executed and then it's something that you've got dissatisfied parents students um, staff so I would just encourage that if this does pass tonight that um, that there's a plan put in place for not only communication but the implementation of the uh, changing grade configuration. Okay, are there any folks who haven't spoken yet that would like to speak? Ms. Williams? Um, I, I will be voting for uh, grade level configure the 6 8 grade level configuration. Um, and not that I wasn't going to before, but to hear from the principals um, and a lot of staff has have reached out to me between our last conversation. Um, to talk about that that need um, again those students are very mature and students themselves are very ready to do that there's always the exception to every rule um, but the majority of our students are ready and the families are ready for them as well so I will be voting yes tonight any other comments before we go back to mrs. Fay and then wrap up mrs. Fay oh I'm sorry I'm sorry I haven't gone to you sorry thank you mrs. Fay Hmm. So I'll 
be voting in opposition to this recommendation. Um, and I thought hearing, well, I, I appreciate hearing from the principals a lot, um, and they do a great job at their schools. Um, they, they all brought up the idea of having the students longer, and that's my very argument for keeping them in elementary school. Um, I do want to clarify that I, at no point in any of this debate over any of the conversations we've had about grade configuration have I ever stated that I have um, the kind of apprehension or fears that, that Mr. Bartle talked about. That's not ever been a part of my debate and my discussion over this. It's always been about identifying what's best for individual communities and within our district. And that um, standardization and one size fits all cookie cutter kind of grade configuration plans I don't think are best. And to, to Mrs. Scotting's point about um, for example, student achievement in math, we know now Dundee's not on this list, but we know that Dundee's math scores are better than all of our middle schools at an, any middle school that has sixth graders. Um, so, you know, the idea that having students longer, well then why not that 5-8 in some of these instead of a 6-8? Or why not the opportunity to look at um, some innovative programming and do a K-8? So I, I also have to really speak for my constituents from Rose Hill who really feel that adopting this puts them in a position um, where they will continue to opt out at the numbers that they are, which is very high once they get to about fourth grade. So they feel that with the removal of sixth grade and the timing with the student assignment plan, um, that they don't have any other options, um, that their options are being limited by this middle school grade configuration. And then, um, so I do have to continue to be a voice for my constituents there. So, I don't think I have anything you know new to say, but I do want I did I think it's really important to clarify that this has never been um, for me about thinking that some sixth graders aren't ready to move to middle school, um, but really just what's best for individual communities within the district, and providing the kind of um, forward thinking, progressive, and responsive education that I think we're capable of doing, but falling back on something that seems to me to be, um, you know, less than what we're capable of doing. Ms. America. Um, I, I will be voting in favor of the grade level configuration changes. Um, I think Mr. Scanlon made a very good point that we do need to make sure that this is executed and implemented well. Um, and that echoes back to actually an article I was reading that was technically about K-8 school and it quoted a study and as I read, for some reason I never read comment sections online. Um, and I decided to read the comment section and the people who had done the study commented and said, you know, really, we found that great configuration doesn't matter as much as you think it does, it's how it's implemented and what you do in the school. Um, I don't think that we should have a cookie cutter approach though. Maybe not all of our middle schools should be 6-8. Obviously Mars is doing very well with a 5-8 setup. If it's working, maybe we look at leaving some schools at that 5-8 uh, model. But what sealed my decision wasn't hearing from the middle school principals, it was hearing from elementary school principals and sixth grade teachers who said, our kids are ready for this. They're ready for more rigor. And I had one who said, I, have, I don't have my class in my classroom at any point in the day. I don't have my full class in my classroom because people are getting pulled out for band, people are getting pulled out for choir, they're getting pulled out because they're doing a different level math than the other students are doing, or they're just being pulled out for so many different things that in a middle school environment could be targeted towards them where they weren't missing other instructional time. Um, and so that really made me think about, yeah, I, thinking back to when I was in sixth grade even, I don't remember being in the classroom at all that year because we were getting pulled out for everything. Uh, and it just seems to fit with our, our goal of increasing rigor in the classroom and making our students college and career ready. It, it's a change that we need to make. 
Any other comments? All right, with that, Mr. Ray, um, roll call, please. Oh, wait. The motion? We didn't have a motion, sorry. Is there a motion? I move to approve the transition of Beverage, McMillan, Monroe, Morton, and Nathan Hale to a 6 8 grade configuration. Is there a second? Second. Is that Mr. Vargas? Yes. Okay. So, motion by Ms. Williams, second by Mr. Vargas to move the, to approve the transition of Beverage, McMillan, Monroe, Morton, and Nathan Hale to a 6 8 grade configuration. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Underwood? Aye. Vargas? Aye. Wayne? Aye. Williams? Aye. Faye? No. Godding? Aye. America? Aye. Scanlon? Aye. Snow? Abstain. Seven aye, one abstention, and one no. Motion carries. With that, we will move to J2D Economic Inclusion Plan. See Mr. Summers coming up. Sorry, I got a few documents. I want to make no, sure you get okay. the right one pulled up. Right. Can you, once you get it pulled up, can you tell us which document it is? Sure. We have four of them listed on our agenda here. Oh, that was it. It's the third. I think Matt said it's the third document. Okay, the third document. All right, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, President Godding, Vice President Williams, thanks again for having us uh, back for some uh, additional discussion on economic inclusion. Uh, we've been involved in, the, in a lot of different conversations on a lot of different fronts, uh, but mainly tonight's presentation is to provide some responses and some answers to questions that we had during the last uh, economic inclusion uh, presentation. So it's a fairly concise and uh, short presentation, so I'll move right into it. Uh, we're just going to cover a few topics tonight. Uh, the, a comparison between uh, a plan that we received or a document that we received that referenced a fair share program, which is a, a EPA or federal government-driven uh, inclusion program, uh, certification, 7% uh, goal analysis, and collaboration. A few of the topics. So just quickly here, there, I put together a few uh, bullet points to really compare the difference between um, the EPA fair share program and what the economic inclusion program that we're proposing uh, OPS approve has. Uh, the EPA fair share is a federally funded program. Of course, the, the program that we've put in front of you is, is uh, driven from the uh, tax levy. Uh, EPA uh, fair share program recognizes an SBA certification, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide, but that's the certification that they, uh, one of the certifications that they recognize. They recognize several different ones. The program that we've placed together, of course, puts em emphasis on Tier 1 and Tier 2 certifications. That's the City of Omaha uh, certification. Uh, the fair share uh, allows for race and gender programs. Of course, we've had a lot of discussion about the state statute and state constitution in Nebraska. Uh, does not allow that. Uh, no preferential treatment based on race or gender. And then also there, I just earmarked the, the goals that are shown. Those are set by region 
and I believe the goals uh, for fair share for this region were set back in October of 06. Um, and there's a, a MBE and a WBE goal, and then of course the, the plan that we've uh, proposed has an overall 7% goal. Uh, certifications, I think it's important just to, just to see a little bit of the difference between the, the types of certifications um, that the two programs would utilize. So a Small Business Administration is a nas national certification. So um, with, within that program, there's a specific code that they track all uh, different types of work to, which is the NACE code. And for general contractors, and this is uh, for, for products and labor, uh, there's 17,779 current firms certified as SBA uh, small business firms. Of course, that's a national certification. And then uh, one layer down into that certification is also a size standard that the SBA uses to identify what they would consider a small business. So in general contracting, um, what they identify as uh, their size standard is a $36.5 million. So a company that does $36.5 million in revenue or less a year would be an SBA certified company. So that's a pretty substantial uh, construction company. Uh, then we also have the, the City of Omaha certification. Of course, the Tier 1 and Tier 2 uh, program that's really focused on local. So we think that's a, a significant uh, win. Currently, you know, there are some challenges with certification. Currently, there's 27 uh, vendors, again, underneath that same NACE code as general contractor uh, uh, certified. So a huge difference um, in the number of, of vendors. A lot of that is suppliers. Um, for, for materials uh, and components like that, the city's current certification is mainly labor. There's not a lot of material suppliers, so there's a little bit of difference in that comparison. And then, of course, the size standard. So ESB, which is Emerging Small Business, is 10% of SBA guideline, or $3.65 million, again, of uh, gross receipts of revenue. And the SB, which is Small Business, is 25% of that same size um, standard. 10% of SBA and 25% of SBA. So you can see the, the sizes of the companies that were, were the programs targeting, again, are the micro companies in, in the local market. Uh, we provided this information here about the, a 7% goal across um, all of the accounts or all of the potential opportunities. Just wanted to, to note a few things. Uh, again, the design and construction um, accounts we feel uh, have the most capacity and that's where the, the documentation and the data that we've gathered shows. Many of the other categories have limited or no certified vendors at this point in time. So uh, if, we apply, if the goal is applied across um, all accounts, we'll have to really find some creative strategies on to try to identify certified vendors to provide work in those categories. Not that we're not already doing that, but I just want to make sure um, that it's known. And, and, and again, we're really being creative with how we can package the work to try to maximize opportunities in these different accounts and different categories. We're not just leaving it as status quo and construction is construction. We're trying to digest inside of the printing, inside of the temporary housing, inside of all these other categories. How can we debundle or unpackage the work to make it so that there's fair competition uh, with, with tier one and tier two, pardon me, tier one and tier two contractors. Um, there was a lot of discussion again at the last board of me about collaboration. Um, I think that we found that with all of our efforts, we've, we've been putting in the work and the effort and we have been getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of opportunity to collaborate. So uh, most of the owner agencies, uh, contractors, um, other, you know, Metro, different folks have been reaching out to us saying, Tell us how do you do it? You know, we've, we've had city officials uh, attend some of our outreach meetings just to try to figure out what we're doing. And I think at the, at the simplest level, you know, we're engaging people in the conversation and we're distinctly taking action. So, so those, are, those are two big pieces that we've been able to do. But we have been participating uh, in, the, in the city's uh, economic inclusion meetings. We're partnering up with some of the certification staff. We had a South Omaha outreach last week where we had uh, some staff from the city actually present on the certification process. They had a table available to, to help answer questions or get the process started. So not just talking about partnering, but actually physically getting together in the same room with the same objective and trying to help from all sides of the economic inclusion 
uh, front. Again, we've, we've had a chance to visit with Metro Community College and we're having some conversations with them about what type of education is needed in the market immediately and then long term to try to help propel uh, the economic inclusion from, with an educational perspective. What does that look like? You know, there's a lot of, lot of need there. So we see some immediate opportunity and we're working on some programs to address the immediate needs. I think the conversation with Metro might be a little bit further out on, on when maybe some of their facilities are done. How do, how do we create a curriculum or how do we create a, a pathway? Much of the conversation that was uh, held here tonight. And then the other piece, you know, to really underscore, there is so many different fronts and, and so many different conversations that we're having on, on the collaborative efforts. You really need someone to lead that. Where their day to day is focused on this, this is their objective, you know, and they're driving the results that are set by policy or set by plan that the, that the board expects of them. Uh, in, in summary, the, the plan focuses spending on local communities, spending in local communities, pardon me. Complies with the state constitution. Um, it's supported by OPS communities and vendors. We've had a lot of different outreach discussions, not only just about opportunities for work, but about the plan, how it would work. Again, partnering with the city on certification, trying to understand what level of debundling we need to go to, and, and those detailed conversations. So. Um, we're, we're trying again to, to try to to attack it from a multiple uh, prong perspective and then this was mentioned earlier tonight but uh, I believe and, and I think the team that's really worked on this day in and day out and, and have been part of the, the frontline conversations this plan puts the district in the leadership role of this issue there's a lot of conversation uh, in the marketplace and a, and a lot of strategizing going on which I think long term will continue to again collaborate and be a part of that but what the community um, has expressed to us, what, what our prime contractors, you know, is, is more about action. And we've been able to take a lot of, a lot of good action on the, on the front end of contracting changes, methodology for the payment, I think, you know, that was mentioned before. But we've been able to take a lot of great steps um, and to have an approved plan, I think, really brings the credibility of everything that's been done. It, it's really gonna energize and continue to propel the momentum forward. So th that's really what I have for, for this evening. And I'm available to answer any questions. Well, I want to thank you for clarifying some of those items that have come up before, both for our sake and for the public so that they understand. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Mr. Snow. <laughs> Obviously, we've had this discussion before. Um, really, not much has changed, nothing's changed in your plan at all. Um, we had people from the community, some people from the community, um, some people just in the field that they actually do come up and advocate that we are doing something different and we need to make a stand now and vote yes and that we need to stop the politicking and think outside, I mean, which is ridiculous in my opinion. I personally believe, and I've said this before, and I'll make my statement one more time, and I'll leave it at that, is everyone always says we can have 7%, but we can exceed that goal. I personally believe I'd rather have set that goal high and fell trying to achieve that goal. I believe that having a third party help us achieve that is the best way to do it. This isn't a third party in Omaha that's been doing This is somebody, this is an organization that has done this outside of Omaha, or, I mean, whoever we decide to, to do that, to help us achieve that, work with you, work with the team to make sure that at the end of the day, their goal is to get us to that goal. And that's been my overall issue with it, is that it should be higher and that we should have a third party help us get to that goal. Now, it doesn't mean I'm, a, I'm voting, because uh, I'm going to vote no for this. And it doesn't mean that I'm against the plan that you guys have created. I've just been advocating for this. And in my opinion, I don't really feel that I've been getting that same fair share. It's, a, it's probably it makes sense <laughs> to that thing there. But I wasn't getting my fair input in that, that it was coming back. It's like, you know what? Well, let's figure out how we can work that or X, Y, and Z, whatever that may be. It was always more hostile. Like, why are you want this, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't you. That's just people I've talked to before about it. But th that's been my issue. And 
I think the in, the intent of the plan is is to be dynamic. So your your comment on what the goal should be, uh, hiring an external component. I think all of those things are still available. I agree. It, it's I agree, not this. I, this is a you know this needs to be living. It has to be in order for us to, the, to utilize the, it. The issue the issue I have is often when people say, well, we can come back to something later on. That's that's all great, but most likely usually you don't come back to issues like that unless they're completely failing. You usually put it in the back of your mind. I'm saying if we start off on the right foot and everyone's like, this is a living document, we can come back, but are you, are you guys going to come back and recommend that we go to 10% or does it the board? Because we're well, not the experts on that. Part, part so of the plan is the you economic, guys. Sure, but part of the plan is the economic inclusion leadership team, which is a cross-functional team made up of, of district. We have representatives on it. It's, it's, a, it's a group of people inside the district outside the district you would bring in other owner agencies from time to time time to time depending on the topic that needs to be addressed in those discussions and that team or that committee is the group that would come back with a recommendation and say we've gotten a year's worth of data of, of real information with this program or six months here's where we're at here's where what adjustments we need to make and this is why so that that group is ultimately the, the conduit back to report and say we're doing a good job of this and, and we should change the goal to 12 because we really found a good source of of, of, of so contracting who, here so who leads that committee uh, the, the, who's the who's the overall vision it leader would, of that it, would it would report up through dr. Turnquist, I believe thank you miss Underwood um, so I was able to, like Mr. Vargas mentioned earlier, I attended the um, contacts to contracts event um, at the South Omaha Library last week, and um, I was thoroughly impressed. Um, it's obvious that uh, our team has really, um, we dove deep into the community, and um, are doing things to, uh, I guess, grease the skids for contractors um, and open doors for contractors um, to provide opportunities that they didn't have before. Um, I think it's, it's obvious that people are seeing us as leaders in the community on this. Um, like you mentioned, um, there, I, I think it was the mayor's chief of staff that was there and attendance and then other community leaders as well just kind of seeing what we're doing um, there were I just want to give two examples of things um, speaking to sort of open opening the doors for contractors um, so one of the things that uh, that they offered was um, providing paying for OSHA training um, which is a hurdle I think for some small business enterprises um, it just the cost of it and the access to it um, and so I thought that was a very creative and realistic way um, to sort of open some doors and then the other thing that they um, had offered was doing a construction Academy um, for contractors which uh, provides information on how to read construction documents or go through specifications um, and things like that so it was just it, it felt like I don't know if grassroots is the right word but um, it, you mentioned that um, you you're engaging in the community and you're taking action and I saw that very clearly at the event that I attended so um, I came away from it feeling really good about things um, I watched the board meeting that uh, the that where this was discussed um, the first time I wasn't able to attend but um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I had watched that but then I also wanted to attend that event um, to get my own perspective on um, kind of what's been going on in the community related to this um, regarding the percentage um, I might be able to offer just I don't know if my thoughts um, would be helpful just from the engineering perspective 
um, I guess when when Jacobs tells us that um, you know seven percent is what's realistic plus some stretch, I'm I'm personally comfortable with that because we need to remember that we also need to be good stewards of the taxpayer's dollar. And um, if, bottom line, we want to get as many bids on these bond projects as, as we can get. Because that means that you're going to get good bids, you're going to get, you're more likely to get bids that, you're more likely to get good bids, you're more likely to get bids that um, are either at or below the um, estimated cost that the architects and engineers put together. So my fear is that if, if we push that percentage higher than what we think is doable, we're either going to get contractors that aren't bidding um, because they, they see what the requirement is and, and the, the, there's just not the capacity realistically um, in the community to be able to provide, you know, 14% or whatever it is. Um, so they're either going to not bid on it or um, they're going to increase their bid. And that becomes, um, in my opinion, even more likely with all of the jobs that are going on right now um, that were mentioned earlier. Uh, there is a lot going on. We. Uh, my firm is really busy right now just from the engineering side of things um, and that's true of architects it's true of contractors um, so it, and not to mention the you know UNMC MCC um, CHI projects that are out there but I think it was either two or three other school districts that just passed bonds as well. Um, I think they were kind of waiting to see how ours went and then uh, went for their own. So there's a lot of competition in the marketplace and I would just um, encourage my fellow board members to keep in mind we, we need to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollar and trying to push something above what's realistic. Um, it, it, to me, it, it's, it's stretching that a little bit and um, it, we might be looking at bids that are coming in a lot higher than anticipated. So that's my thoughts on that. Thank you. Anyone else have comments? Ms. Williams. So my first thought is I've, um, we previously had the conversation of talking about um, a position, a program director, and I've went back and forth between a consultant I'm in a program director and really coming to the real realization that it is truly up to Mr. Evans to um, hire that staff and so I don't think that's something that we should talk about. But however, my personal thought is as we pass this plan, you know as well as I do that I, I believe if you, if you say it, you claim it and it comes true. Um, so I'm, I'm very much in favor of this plan. I have been all along. We're, we are leading the work, and that's something, Mark, that you said, that the city has noticed. And outside of the city, people are noticing. I mean, you have people that are trying to get consultant jobs and, and come here to get some of this work because what we're doing is truly leading away. We went from zero, and now we're at something that it's feasible, and we can realistically do this, and we can grow this. Um, my other thought would be if we can also work with uh, Jacobs to help retain the services, uh, Ms. Gillespie and uh, Ms. Mack, at minimal cost to the district to help us as we're transitioning, as we find we're looking for that right fit um, for a program director. Um, again, that is up to, that's, I think that's Mr. Evans' call to make, um, but we can't ask him to make that until we have a plan to go on. Um, and so with that, uh, I move to approve the economic inclusion plan. There's a motion to approve the economic inclusion plan. Is there a second? Second. Second, um, second from Mr. Scanlon. He beat you to it, Ms. America. Um, any further comments or discussion? Mrs. Fay. So I'm going to be voting in support of this plan tonight. And um, I 
just as Mr. Snow said, I don't have any, part never have had any particular problems with the plan itself. Um, my, my, my concern about this whole process is that I really, truly believe that, you know, we've had, what, a month since the last board meeting. And I, I really, truly believe that you probably, we could have um, taken what has been a fairly divisive issue and we could have a unanimous vote. I really believe that. Um, and send the message that several folks from the community asked us to send. Um, if there had been, this had been a more um, inclusive process and I really don't think it was. And I, I know that there were direct requests to um, sit down with the dissenting vote from our last board meeting. I know that there were direct requests to review policy um, just as a starting point and to come at this from a policy angle instead of approving a very long and detailed plan, which as Ms. Williams pointed out, those are really the things that Mr. Evans should be doing is approving the plan once we've set those parameters through policy. And so I think um, while I will be voting yes because I want to move on past this and I want to get to the next thing, big thing that we need to deal with as a district and I recognize that um, we need to keep moving forward. Um, I hope that when other potentially divisive and large issues come before us, we step back and we look at them from the perspective we should be, which is at, at a policy level, and that we take into account that um, building consensus is something to be valued. It listening to all the voices on the board and trying to to work together on these things that are um, more controversial is important and sends a really powerful message to the public that we're uh, trying to do something in a united way. That's not lockstep. That's not what that means. But I don't feel that that happened on this after some really direct requests to try and make it happen. So let me just respond to that briefly. Um, according to Webster's, a policy is defined as a high level overall plan embracing the general goals and acceptable procedures, especially of a governmental body. I reached out to several folks just to get a clearer understanding and a, a plan truly is a policy. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about economic inclusion plan being the policy. Um, a st student assignment plan is a policy. Strategic plan is a policy. So from that aspect, I think what we are approving tonight is a policy which is encompassed in this plan. Um, and plans often have greater detail. For instance, the student assignment plan, the strategic plan, which maybe have an endpoint or are part of a program, and this happens to be part of a program related to the bond, which you know, we hope we'll be able to pass future bonds and it doesn't um, necessarily end, but, gets, uh, but has that opportunity to be tweaked as we move um, through it, similar to other plans that would be tweaked. Um, I felt as though the items reflected in Appendix E which were the specific questions which I asked. I asked all Board of Education members to send their questions specifically to Mr. Ray so that from a strategic and from a um, professional knowledge of those answers, they could be answered. And so if you reflect on, and I cannot get it open, um, Appendix E, that specifically answered the questions that were submitted to mm -hmm. Mr. Summers, is my understanding, Correct. from board members. And I think that he very clearly um, answered those. I read through those and I thought that it was very clear what the explanations were and the items specific to um, the percentage. I can tell you, and I know other board members have heard as well from community members that we need to be very wise and very prudent as that percentage is selected. 
because of the very things that I mentioned at the last time we had the discussion and that Mrs. Underwood mentioned this time. We are the stewards of the taxpayers' dollars and we should use those wisely to ensure that we get competitive bids and to ensure that we get an adequate number of bids to include the work that we need to have done and that we don't end up overpaying for work because then that would not be that would not be um, prudent and we would not be good um, at our governing role. So from that standpoint, I thought that Appendix E very clearly answered those questions related to percentage and I think the PowerPoint as well answered those questions and um, so I guess that's how I approached it was to ask board members to please submit those questions and as far as I know Mr. Ray everyone who submitted the questions you forwarded to Mr. Summers correct yes are there any additional comments or Mr. Vargas thank you um, so first, I will I will be voting no on this. I want to explain a little bit on. Um, you know, I reflect a lot on my own job and the work that I do and, and the way that we approach work in this, because obviously many of us are not experts in this field, and we will never be. We're not charged with being experts. We're charged with making decisions and setting goals. In my mind, in my work, a goal constitutes a very ambitious, uh, a guiding point the North Star the North Star for how we change dramatically change the way that we approach something it's what gets us out of the status quo I think for us OPS we have been doing things differently already in many different other places we've been doing things different strategic plan we're starting to do things differently with our operations we've been making headways in so many places and at our level setting a goal is one of the most important things because if it's just right now, I, everything in the plan with, in terms of what we may do, I think are all really good things. And in fact, I think Jacob Jacobs is capable of doing many of these things. I've seen them do things. I, I, I think they have the skill set to be able to deliver on these things. It's not a question of that. It's also not a question of I don't, I don't think our staff is, is able to deliver on these things. It's actually not a question of that either. It, it's more of a question of a goal changes actions. And if our goal is at 7%, that's going to guide everything that we do in this plan. That's how it has been in my experience as a teacher. When you set a goal for a student and you're sort of diagnosing whether and you're trying to figure out what to do for the next year with them, that's how it's been working with any schools I've worked with, working with any clients I have. And if we're setting a goal that we still, and I, and I still hear, you know, when I talk with, you know, constituents or even our board members, <laughs> it's attainable. Like we, you know, I, I get that. But I don't want it to be attainable, just attainable. I don't want it to just be realistic. Because if it's realistic, it means we could have just gotten it and it would have just been like, if we do just you know, some more effort that will reach it. We are leaders in this. I truly think we are visionaries in this. We've been, already been doing so much. We have a lot of momentum. For that reason, I think the goal is probably the most important piece. And if we don't think more so about how it's gonna change our actions, this is a missed opportunity. Even you know, you know something that you mentioned is uh, if down the line we see that uh, we are missing capacity or we're not seeing some of we might not be able to meet some of our goals, we'll have to find it. See, that's exactly the piece that I'm a little worried about. We're going to have to find it. We may not find it if we set a higher goal. That makes us think about how we actually have to produce it. We have to produce and train and make sure that our are these 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 companies these organizations the contractors whoever is bidding has the capacity is as we have as many people in that percentage that are certified to be able to actually win work because we're not going to just find them we're going to have to create them and that's sort of the, the the larger scale of in the city of omaha we have to create them and I, and and so I, we, the meeting started late at South Omaha, so I actually had to leave at another engagement. But I went back and I, I called some of the people that are at the event, um, some contractors that I asked them, I want, just want to hear your opinion, and then some other community leaders, and I got mixed results. Because I think there was good things that we did, and that's why I think it's a good step in the right direction, because I don't see many other organizations doing it to that extent. But there's real barriers for why some of these companies are not, are, are not certified real real barriers 
that only are going to change if we set a tremendously uh, ambitious yet feasible goal. When we all use that language, I will be extremely satisfied and I would say yes to this. But because we're not saying it's tremendously ambitious and it's feasible, saying we're really thinking like, okay, it's, it's pretty good, we can do it, that means I think we're settling just a little bit and I don't want to settle even just a little bit because we are, we're embarking on something very, very, uh, this is just a unique opportunity for us. For that reason, knowing that we have the capacity, I do believe in Jacobs, I believe in our staff, that's why I think we should be setting a, a better goal. If we were setting a smaller goal, I think that would send the message that we actually don't believe in, in our people. I think that's the opposite of this. So my no is more in, I want us to be more aspirational. I want us to be very conscious of our taxpayer dollars, but also knowing that I want to be conscious of our taxpayer dollars going back into the community. Because I think that's also doing right by our community. And so that's why I'm voting no. Ms. Merrickham? Um, <clears throat> if, if I can ask a clarifying question, and then I'll say what I wanted to say. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand, Mr. Vargas, what you mean when you say if we raise the goal, it would lower the barriers to certification. Uh, so I'm, what I mean is, if we raise the goal, then the strategies that we then take will be maybe less focused on um, outreach and more focused on trainings. I mean, more focused on not just partnering, but actually setting up more cohesive pathways for education to make sure that we're removing those barriers for people getting certified. Which, again, when I, when I talk with some of the individuals from this meeting, there's some that are like, okay, I feel a lot better, which is great, I think, to Miss Enderwood's point. You know, there's, they're providing access and we're starting to build things with the city, but there's also, they're like, well, I still don't have the capacity. I don't even know how to put together a bed. I don't even know, uh, you know, we don't have somebody to do that. Like, we don't have somebody that's really adept at the, the accounting piece that I can do the work. I just don't know. So, and so there's still barriers. Let me add and, one, yeah. one comment on, on that particular piece. So uh, one of the things that, that I've actually, seeing that gap, which is, which is fairly significant across uh, most of the vendors and uh, contractors that we've been working with. We're putting together a, a, a course, and, and um, uh, Board Member Underwood had mentioned this, and we talked about it at the South Omaha Outreach, to provide um, the participants some of those foundations. Um, you know, for, for a company to have a, a few uh, individuals and, and turn into Kiwit after a three week or four week class, that's, that's not this. But what it will do is provide um, document reading, some fundamental principles about estimating, how to, how to handle or how to um, create good safety culture, how to market your company, how to schedule work, all of the fundamental things that contractors need to to understand, to not be masters at, but to understand as a small business what things in a contract are big deals. There's a lot of stuff in contracts that are there because it has to be there, but what are the payment terms? What's the termination clause? So we're, we're putting together, and I've been working on it kind of um, quietly, I would say, for a few weeks, and I have the support of my leadership, which is significant, um, and we're, we're wanting to, to, to kick off our first class at the beginning of June. Um, but we understand the urgency and the need. So I know we haven't, it's not in the plan right now, but we have to do those things. It's something that Jacobs is just doing on our own. We're not asking a bunch of vendors to come in and take care of it for us because that, that issue is the same conversation that I get into is at the very technical level, what, what building blocks do we need to start putting in place? So um, we'll have some more details in the future about what that looks like. Uh, over the next couple of weeks have been sharing it with Dr. Turnquist. Um, but again, it's, it's actionable. It's, it's, it's bringing people into a classroom and sitting down and looking at technical information, building those parts and pieces. So uh, I, just, I just wanted to, yeah. to cut, it came up a couple of times, so I just wanted to make sure I got that. that that's, that's tremendously helpful. It actually gets more to the, right. I'm just responding because there's I'm, something you're you responding to me. But, well, okay, go ahead. Because you I'm asked me a question. But. Is it okay or are you? Okay, go ahead and finish, but Ms. America wasn't done, and I wanted to make sure we were respectful from a point of order. I did not call the point of order. Um, I, am, I am going to be voting for, in favor of our economic inclusion plan. Um, 
I, I disagree with the statement that this hasn't been an inclusive process because I think as board members, we've been invited to sit down one-on-one -on -one at times and meet with the representatives from Jacobs and discuss our concerns or just our general ideas um, and things that we thought were important to the plan. And we've been involved in the shaping of this since day one. Um, anytime we've had questions, we've had the opportunity to raise them and have, have them be answered. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but we discussed this at the last meeting where we discussed this. We can change the percentage. We have the power as board members to do that. And if we think it should be a different percentage, we can make a motion to do that. Um, I know at our past meeting, Mr. Wayne had made a motion to do that, but there were some things that we did not all agree on and so it didn't pass. But if there are board members that feel the percentage should be different than 7%, there is nothing stopping you from changing that. <laughs> Mr. Scanlon. I'm a, I've got the background in the constru construction industry and steel fabrication. And I would say that um, this is a very incredible program that doesn't exist. I mean, the states that um, we do work for, they set aside a percentage and basically they don't care who who you outsource your uh, cleanup to or or supplies all they care is you know you've got a 2.5 percent goal to mat or to meet and if you can meet it great sometimes if you can't they put a dollar amount on it and say well you know the this low bid um didn't meet it but we're willing to waive it and usually those are around 2.5 um percent uh, never have i ever seen a program that tries to uh, help uh, emerging businesses learn the ropes of the contracting business and get in contact with uh, general contractors. Um, I will say that I feel that this is a very ambitious goal of 7% based on the current capacity of Omaha. And I think if, um, if we can have an honest assessment what do we truly have in your professional opinion? I, in my professional opinion, I think it's truly more like three to 5% of what our capacity currently has. Um, if Jacobs can give an honest assessment of the current market conditions. Um, I, I, we have some information about um, what, what some of the city's successes have been, and, and that's in the Appendix E. Um, and I believe that the, in the last year, they were a little bit under uh, 9%. How they count their goal is a little bit different than how our plan would count it. Um, since that point in time, you'll, you'll, the, what the data is showing us is there's been a significant decrease in recertifications. So the pool of capacity, which is a big part of this conversation has uh, diminished, has gone away. Um, so we're, we're trying to identify why and can we recapture some of that capacity. Um, but it is, it, it is a, a significant leap forward or it will be a significant leap to hit that goal. Currently, again, with some of the, the information, there's 27 providers in the market in general contracting and we have um, a goal of 7% of 222 million really to spend if we took a snapshot today with those 27 entities. Now they're not all, they don't all have the same capability. They all do a little bit different type of work. So we got to continue to drive into the details of what is their true capability because just being certified doesn't indicate capacity or the number of folks they have or their, their quality of work and all these other things that go into being successful. So um, I think given the, the information that we have available and all of the discussions and data mining that we've done, we definitely feel like 7% is going to be a challenge for sure. There's just no, just looking purely at information it is. And then when you dive into what the information actually is, it, it really becomes uh, apparent about how significant of a stretch that's going to be. So you'd say that we're already setting this very high bar for what the capacity of yes, Omaha sir. currently is. Yes, sir. And if we continue and implement this plan, the 
a success would be that we start to build that capacity as we continue through the bond program immediately correct so I think that the, what board members need to understand is we need a starting point a realistic starting point and to say well you know I want you to I want you to go undefeated this season and you're just starting your team I think that's unrealistic it's unfair to the district it's unfair to Jacobs and it also then becomes a oh well hey why didn't you meet this 10 percent goal I said we wanted 10 percent well I'm telling you it's not a it's not possible at this point the professional opinion is seven percent you can aspire to do everything and have it be you know 25 percent and all this but if the capacity is not there which is what they're telling us then it is a a foolish goal to set because then the community will begin to lose faith in OPS saying well they didn't reach the 10 percent they're not trying to get to that 10 percent it's going to be a stretch just to get to the seven percent and I think that that is a very very aggressive starting point when we currently don't have that capacity within Omaha but hopefully this program builds it in a very unique way that is I've never seen in the uh, construction industry so I think that this this goal is is very realistic in the sense of being uh, very ambitious and far-reaching so I think that uh, some board members should realize that it is not settling for the minimal amount okay anyone who hasn't spoken yet mr. Wayne I will be voting no just for a couple of reasons uh, one the general contractor listing is a little misnomer um, first of all it's a four-hour exam you got to carry workers comp just to even be able to be a general contractor which is an additional five thousand typically four to five thousand um, so for example jo uh, Jackson concrete who gets a lot of city work they did like two hundred something thousand they're not a general contractor so I don't want you to assume that because there's not that many general contractors that that means something because the general contractor there's different requirements so there's a lot of other things that that involves so I just want the board to understand that I'm concerned now about hiring somebody in-house when um, we don't know our budget we've heard about the deficiencies right now in, in our in that area regarding our facilities and, and buildings and grounds um, we have a new teachers contract uh, when asked last meeting about whether teachers might be let go or not or hire less or bigger classrooms it was all in flux and I think by demanding that we hire somebody or put in a plan that we hire somebody concerns me without knowing the whole budget and not knowing the new priorities that or how they're going to handle the, the audit that we just got not even sure how this fits into what we just got and the last two are kind of my biggest reasons I don't think this process was inclusive a week went by past our last meeting there was no contact between myself and, and board leadership or the district um, I sent an email around some policy and it was a long detailed policy but I thought it was a starting point point. Um, and there was no dialogue there was no conversation and I looked at the committees that I've been involved with and the conversations and the ongoing dialogue even when we went back to the bond where we didn't have committees you know I made sure And I think district staff made sure to address every one of or try to address every one of each board members concern and put a plan together that could be unanimously unanimously supported I don't think that effort was there I just feel like to have an inclusive plan that wasn't inclusive is, is just a very interesting tale but if we're going to adopt a plan then I think we have to adopt the best practices and study after study shows the best practice for an inclusion plan is a third party monitoring system so we're setting a goal and we're adopting a plan but we have not even in this plan said we're going to carve out expenses or however it's going to work to have a third party monitoring system we're talking about hiring somebody internally but again best practices across the country you can google it you can look at other cities that have done it it's a third third party modern system with constant updates 
we're saying we're just going to leave that up to the administration. That's fine. But then don't ask me to adopt a plan unless all the best, best practices are in there. That, that's my biggest concern is that we're not adopting all the best practices, we're adopting some. And I can't support that at this point. I just feel like it wasn't very inclusive and I really like to see a, a spell out how we're going to monitor this plan. We did it for the strategic plan. We have stats and uh, we had on our, our superintendent evaluation today all these different arrows pointing different direction. We don't even have a framework on which we're going to monitor. And so that, that's one of the concerns that I have, and maybe it'll be addressed later, but here's a, here's a point that I do want to make. This was held up. It didn't pass a month ago. And without any board discussion among board members, without any sitting down and trying to find a compromise, we just added almost $12 million because the original plan was for 7% of just construction. Just imagine how much more we might have been able to add if we had a real conversation on the board. I did respond to the email. Um, I, I do want to clarify on the position, I think, that Mr. Evans has said numerous times, that it's a repurposed position. Um, that exists currently um, that would be repurposed into this position if we were to approve the plan. Um, the other item that I want to reflect on is the fact that Jacobs has been the third party um, and hired an independent um, consultant to come back to us with this plan, to develop this plan, which the experts on our board who are in the construction industry have all said is a very impressive um, plan compared to anything that they've seen in the community um, and Jacobs did that um, at their own expense and not at taking away general fund dollars from instruction nor at raising the price of their fee within the bond itself so I do want to address those those items because I think that is important to the taxpayer who expects us to use our um, general fund dollars wisely for instruction and the folks who voted for the bond who expect us to use um, the bond dollars for construction of new facilities. Is there any new information that anyone wants to bring? Mr. Snow. Okay, so um, I will have to correct one of my board members. Setting a high goal is not foolish. It's not foolish. 10% is not foolish. The city set their goal at 14%. They came in at 9 I mean, you hear that discussion now that the, the mayor has to really talk about the goal that she set, the previous mayor before her set that goal as well. So it's not a foolish goal. Um, I, just, I just really wanted to get that off my chest because I felt like that was miscon. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other new items that anyone wants to discuss. Uh, Mr. Ray, roll call. Underwood? Aye. Vargas? No. Wayne? No. Williams? Aye. Faye? Aye. Godding? Aye. America? Aye. Scanlon? Aye. Snow? No. Six aye, three no. Motion carries. With that, we will move on to uh, J2E, which is the April 2015 investment purchases. I'm just going to quickly tell you why I pulled that off the agenda. Um, there is a $25 million purchase of Atlantic Global Yield Opportunity Fund, and I, um, it's my understanding that that was not discussed at the OSERS trustees meeting as far as specifically what that was. So in the meantime here, we've reached out to uh, Mr. Smith to find out. It's my understanding that it's a movement of funds from the Fountain Capital Fund, which is being discontinued and, and closed out into another high yield fixed income fund, um, which was a high yield in fixed income fund into more of a global yield um, to ensure that those funds are fully invested in something. So I just wanted to make sure that there was clarification to the board on 
it's a large purchase and um, so I want to make sure that there was clarification on that item. Is there any questions on that? Mrs. Fay. I appreciate you pulling it off and seeking clarification. Is it just if that since that fund was discontinued, is it just so that we are um, consistent with our investment policy statement because of the percentages that we allocate to the various well I'm I'm assuming it is if the um, just trying to stay balanced. right if the trustees approved that item at the last OSERS meeting I'm assuming it stayed within the asset allocation and, and there was no been. discussion it was presented without discussion so um, the, the assumption being that it's just to keep the asset allocation balanced um, since the one fund was discontinued right I think until not okay. leave 25 million sitting in cash right it would be the assumption right um, so if there's no I guess if there's a motion for the um, the approval of all of those um, purchases that would be the I move approval of the April 2015 investment purchases for OSERS is there a second? Okay, so motion by Mrs. Fay and a second by Ms. Williams of the April 15th investment purchases, which are the, I'm not sure it's April 15th, April of 2015 purchases, which are in front of us on the attachment. Is there any questions? If not, roll call, please. Vargas? Aye. Wayne uh, Williams? Aye. Faye? Aye. Godding? Aye. America? Aye. Scanlon? Aye. Snow? That's seven aye. Motion carries. Um, I don't think you called my name. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but you're in my adding. Um, under right. I. I didn't. I didn't think I heard it either, but I thought it must have been. I also didn't call on Mrs. Fay earlier, so I apologize. Um, so now we're going to move back to J2B, which is the first reading policy 4007, and I will call upon Mrs. Nealis Brush. If I can, Mrs. Godding, since I asked to be pulled, for it to be pulled off, yes. and then maybe that will provide Mrs. Nealis Brush with the opportunity to be more brief in her explanation. So I asked for this to be pulled off. Um, for two reasons. Number one, I have personally received a lot of um, contact from staff who have been confused about pra past practices and current implementation of the change. Not, not the policy as it is here, but as we adopted it back uh, around the end of the year, I think. Um, so I appreciate the fact, and, and I've talked to Mrs. Scotting about it quite a bit, and I appreciate her um, helping me work through this, that Mrs. Nina Sprash has brought forward a workable compromise for the time being. I believe that there's still more work that needs to be done on this policy and um, would like for us to look for f at future years at how we can work some of these things with the district calendar. I understand, um, based on my conversations with Mrs. Godding, that it's perhaps too late to make any calendar changes for this 15-16 school year, but I hope that we will um, get some data about the high um, traffic uh, days of uh, during the school year when we have a lot of teachers who are taking advantage of whatever, if it's leave or um, however they're doing it, taking days off in order to participate in whatever religious holidays they observe. So I think that some of that can be addressed through calendar, um, working with our calendar. And then it's a lot easier when your calendar is more accommodating to some of those high traffic days or high volume days. Um, it's a lot easier to be more flexible with the, hol the religious holidays that are not observed as frequently. Um, so I appreciate this coming forward as perhaps an, an interim policy, but I also pulled it off because I'm just um, opposed in principle to the first reading of any policy being on the consent agenda. I just believe that all first 
policy readings should be brought before the board as an action item as opposed to consent. Thank you. And it really was specific in this particular instance to Good Friday when I think we had 500 and over 500 um, certified staff absent from buildings. So that was a, a challenge for building leadership and I'm sure for Dr. Garnett um, to work through staffing. Um, but I've asked Mr. Ray to help us through getting through the calendar for 1617 in an earlier, giving us plenty of time so that we can work through some of those things. Does anyone have any questions just so that you have an understanding of, of why this was developed and this was developed in conjunction, it's my understanding, with OEA? Uh, OEA and, and actually all of the unions. So the initial language was drafted uh, uh, with my discussion uh, with OEA and, and, and part of that discussion is really, I, I feel, was a very collaborative pro process. I sent the language off to them after we crafted it and received uh, no commentary back um, with regard to the language. So uh, I, I believe that they uh, were supportive of the language proposed. And, and I would uh, just uh, to walk you through the new practice uh, with regard to the district uh, to give notice uh, to all the employees uh, that are out there listening. Uh, employees who desire to observe a religious holiday occurring during the school year are required to use available personal or otherwise eligible vacation would be a good example of that leave. Uh, so if they have that type of uh, leave available to them, they're required to use that first. If those employees, for example, uh, personal days, uh, there's only about three of them a, a year for a teacher contract in the teachers, for example, and they have exhausted those personal or otherwise eligible leave, they may be granted time off without pay to observe a religious holiday provided such leave does not pose an undue hardship to the district. And what does undue hardship mean? It typically means, uh, for example, you know, if you're a teacher, you couldn't be gone uh, for a month uh, from the, the building that would pose an undue hardship. So certain jobs may have uh, less windows of time that they're able to be gone for a religious holiday exception. And some jobs may um, have a longer period of time uh, because we might have more coverage or availability with regard to undue do hardship. So it uh, just uh, sort of depends on that. Uh, employees who have exhausted uh, their personal otherwise eligible leave to observe a religious holiday may be uh, requested unpaid uh, leave to attend a, uh, to personal matters that cannot be resolved at any time other than during the school day. And so uh, that sort of uh, provides uh, some flexibility if they have used all of their holiday, uh, all of their personal days, for example, for these religious uh, holidays, uh, and they have to do something during the school day and they don't have any leave left, it allows some unpaid time uh, with regard to that religious exception. So I, I think it provides that flexibility um, that the employees are, are desiring. It also provides a clear notice, I think, as to what the expectations of the district are uh, with regard to practice and religious holiday exemptions. And I, I, and I believe that it, it reflects a comparable good practice uh, looking at comparable employers as well. Are there any questions? Okay, with, with that, um, Mrs. Ms. Williams. I move to approve the recommended changes to policy 4007. There's a motion to approve the recommended changes to policy 4007. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. America. So motion by Ms. Williams and a second by Ms. Merrick to approve the changes to policy 4007. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, roll call please. Wayne. Williams. Aye. Faye. Aye. Godding. Aye. America. Aye. Scanlon. Aye. Underwood. Aye. Vargas. Aye. <coughs> Seven aye, one no. Motion carries. With that, I would um, refer you to receipt of reports, the Educational Service Unit Coordinating Council um, monthly meeting report from April is on the board agenda. And with that, Ms. Williams. I move that the Board of Education go into closed session for the protection of the public interest and for the pro 
I'm tongue-tied this evening, and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals to discuss with the superintendent, secretary to the board, and legal counsel, legal advice, and pending litigation. Motion by Ms. Williams to go into closed session. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Ms. Williams and second by Ms. Merica to go into closed session. Roll call, please. Williams. Aye. Faye. Aye. Godding. Aye. America. Aye. Scanlon. Aye. Underwood. Aye. Vargas. Aye. Wayne. Eight aye. Motion carries. Let me remind the board that the purpose for closed session is for the protection of the public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals to discuss with the superintendent, secretary to the board, and legal counsel, legal advice, and pending litigation.